you briefly discussed magic in one of the podcasts on Axe. Mm -hmm. How does real magic actually work? How did the magicians in Egypt duplicate some of the works Moses did? What about the Ephesian magicians or even magic today? Do they recite incantations mm -hmm. calling on demonic powers who perform the actual miracles? What is a Christian's response when we encounter something like this? Well, I, I, would, I would suggest that the only coherent response to this is that hostile divine beings do indeed have real powers. Now, now while you could say you know, frankly, without any real proof that, that the Egyptian magicians in the story of Moses' confrontation with Pharaoh were doing just tricks, you know, human tricks like stage magic. I mean, you could say that, but again, there's, there's no actual proof in the passage to say that's all it was. While you can sort of go there, it, it's a little harder to do the same thing with the mentions of magic in the book of Acts, Acts 8, you know, 9 through 11, Acts 13, Acts 19, 19. Uh, those contexts clearly link the references to magic, to contact with or worship of other divine powers, you know, powers of darkness. And several of those are in the context of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Now, if you actually go to some of these passages and you look up the, the Greek term behind uh, magic used in them, uh, the, the term there is magia. It's easy to see where we get our word magic, you know, from that. And bedag. Bauer, Donker, Art, and Gingrich note that this term refers to a rite or rites, R-I-T-E-S, ordinarily using incantations designed to influence or control transcendent powers. So in the, in the Greco-Roman world, the classical world, uh, Greek language would have been the dominant language, of course, you, you'd have this term used of specifically the use of incantations to contact or influence or control or manipulate or barter, you know, with some divine power, again, some entity. Now, I want to I want to just pull up here briefly Clinton, Arnold, Clinton Arnold's Ephesians commentary. Now, Clinton Arnold uh, is an evangelical New Testament scholar, and he's probably done the most work, uh, certainly in the evangelical orbit, but arguably he's he's sort of one of the top 10 guys just in academia who have... Uh, done a lot of work related to this question of magic. And in his uh, Ephesians commentary, he says this. I'm going to quote from this, and it's going to be a long quotation, but I think you'll find it interesting. He says, uh, he, he's commenting here on the, the image of Artemis, which is Diana of the Ephesians. Remember Acts in a 19 grade is Diana of the Ephesians, or maybe your English translation actually uses the term Artemis. If you've ever seen a picture of Diana or Artemis, it's this feminine goddess figure that looks like she has a hundred breasts. And so this is what Arnold is commenting on. They're not actually breasts, okay? They're something else. So here's what he says. The meaning of the rows of bulbous objects on the chest of Artemis has proved a mystery to interpreters. Some early Christian interpreters identified them as female breasts and saw this as an expression of a fertility motif. This interpretation has not been generally accepted because of the differences in shape, if you actually take a close look at them. Numerous other ideas have been suggested, such as eggs, grapes, nuts, and even testicles. The latter view has a number of prominent adherents because in some of the ancient religions, mutilated body parts were attached to the cultic image of a deity. The most convincing explanation yet has recently been offered by a scholar named Sarah Morris, who teaches at UCLA, who concludes that the bulbous objects are comparable to leather goatskin pouches called korsha. These are known from Hittite magical practices. These little bags were filled with magical material and used as fetish objects. She observes that the Hittite deities associated with the Kersha were often associated with protecting people and places and were frequently invoked in oaths and called upon in magical rites. She suggested an ancient Anatolian cult image at Ephesus, to which rows of such bags were attached, was the predecessor to the image of the Ephesian Artemis. As such, the bags functioned as symbols for fecundity, spiritual power, and protection. The bags may also provide a clue into understanding ancient testimony about magical words. Now, he was going to, Arnold is going to reference something here called the Ephesian letters that were said to be inscribed on the cultic image of Artemis. So this is not a, a biblical text. These are, 
this is going to be Greco-Roman pagan texts that scholars refer to as the Ephesian letters. So continuing with Arnold, he says, Morris believes that these magical words, which were used in spells and incantations, quote, could derive from Hittite phrases carried down over the centuries, unquote. According to Anaxilus, which is a, an ancient text, the Ephesian letters were contained in little sewn bags, which Morris thinks might be explained by the Korsha. By this, she suggests that not only did the Ephesian letters have an ancient pedigree in Anatolian, that is Hittite, magical practices, but they may have been contained in the little bulbous sacks attached to the cultic image of the Ephesian goddess Artemis. According to Luke, okay, we're back in the biblical material now, this is Arnold still commenting. According to Luke, many people who were devotees of this cult became Christians during Paul's ministry there. In fact, so many people were turning to Christ that it was beginning to have an adverse effect on the sales of silver shrines to the goddess. This is what led to the Guild of Silversmiths raising the alarm that caused the mob uprising in the theater in Acts 19. That's page 21 from Arnold's commentary. I'm going to skip over to page 31 now. He says, one of the dramatic incidents that Luke narrates about Paul's ministry in the city involves a failed exorcism attempted by an itinerant Jewish exorcist and priest named Sceva. We talked about him in a previous podcast. When Sceva and his sons attempted to add the name of Jesus to their exorcistic formulae, the demonized man responded violently and the group was injured. According to Luke, this prompted a great fear and conviction within the believing community, and they brought out the magical texts they still possessed and burned them. In Luke's estimation, the value of the text that went up in flames that day was the equivalent of 50,000 days' wages. It is not at all surprising that this event happened in Ephesus, although it probably could have taken place in any city of the Roman Empire. Ephesus, though, had a reputation in antiquity as a place where magical practices flourished. Now, Arnold is going to refer to a book, another book that he has written. What I'm going to do is some of these, these texts I can provide for you on the website uh, with this episode of the podcast. But the first one here, uh, or that, that little statement about uh, how Ephesus was a place where magical practices flourished, that comes from Arnold's book, scholarly book called Ephesians, Power and Magic. It's kind of an expensive book, but if you can get it, I highly recommend it. And Arnold continues here uh, in two sources that I'm going to post for you. He says, the practice of magic was predicated on a worldview that recognized the widespread presence and influence of good and evil spirits on every area of life. Magic represented a means of harnessing spiritual power and managing life's issues through rituals, incantations, and invocations. Our knowledge of the phenomena of magic has been facilitated greatly by the discovery of nearly 250 magical papyri in the sands of Egypt. These illustrate the kinds of rituals, spells, formulae, recipes for amulets, curses, and all the rest of the phenomenon that characterized Roman-era magical practices and techniques. The extant texts have been translated into English and are made available in a volume called the Greek Magical Papyri in Translation. In addition to these texts are numerous other witnesses to magic that include literary references to magical practices, so on and so forth. Now, I'm going to attach two sources that, that the questioner and anyone else interested in this topic can read. One is Arnold's article on magic in the Dictionary of Paul and His Letters, and the other one is the his also the author is Arnold, uh, his article on the magical papyri that I just read about from his source uh, in the Dictionary of New Testament Backgrounds. So what we can conclude from all of this is that these references to magic are not just stage tricks, okay? They were associated both in the New Testament text and also in texts outside the New Testament in Greco-Roman uh, paganism with doing things, either uttering an incantation, making a little object, making a little spell or a potion or whatnot to felicit facilitate contact with demonic powers, with supernatural entities to again cajole them or barter with them to do something on your behalf. So uh, again, I, I don't know how we can just sort of take these references in the Bible and just say, oh, they were just doing doing the soft shoe, you know, the, with the hat and the cane and little, you know, stage tricks that uh, people probably could figure out or, or just knew what they were doing. That isn't the way they're presented. And so does the magic really work? Well, that if spiritual powers, demonic powers are 
paying attention, we'll just put it that way, uh, to solicitation? The answer would be yes. Uh, they, they actually were approachable through these means. Now, this takes me mentally back. I'm not going to get go into this very long, but a few years ago, actually, it's probably about 10 years ago, I went to hear a paper uh, at an SBL meeting, Society of Biblical Literature, a regional meeting, where a guy named Jordan Paper, a professor in, in the Northwest, was giving a paper. I had read Paper's book on polytheism called The Gods Are Many. P Jordan Paper is a practicing polytheist. He's retired now from teaching, but uh, I s still see him at time to time at, at SBL meetings. I know what he looks like. He's a practicing polytheist, and he was very transparent about his quote-unquote faith. Okay, th this is a scholarly meeting. Again, he's not holding anything back here. He says, basically, this only works if you solicit this kind of contact. It doesn't just happen. You have to want it and you have to do things to solicit it. And the powers, I mean, he would use these terms, you know, the, the, the powers, uh, the gods, again, the spirits will respond if you are open to their to their contact, to, to, to what they can do for you. And this was his faith. This is something he lived out every day. And he just presented it like it was normative, you know, to a room full of scholars. And of course, everybody clapped nicely at the end. You know, it just made me think if you'd have presented something that would have been evangelistic about Jesus, they probably would have, you know, asked you not to come back. But the polytheism was okay. But the, again, this whole idea is still around today. And it's sort of by those who are involved in it, it still works the same way. So I don't know on what basis we would go look back at the ancient text and say, ah, this was just a lot of hokum. Uh, I think there's more to it than that.